Amendments in so far this morning. Before we get to amendments, though, we have we learned yes, late yesterday that the court system can testify today. So Nancy Mead, the general counsel for the Alaska court system, um, is here. I would ask Ms. Mead to come forward. The specific area that I would like her to make a presentation about and answer questions is the bail schedule, which has been a, been a topic of much discussion. Uh, and so I thought it would be important for the to hear from the court system on the bail schedule, as it, particularly as it is not part of the legislative legislature's actions on justice reform. Good morning, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Nancy Mead, general counsel for the Alaska court system. I'm going to rearrange this a tiny bit. And uh, I certainly will answer any questions anybody has about the bail schedule, but I'd like to just, as, as a beginner, uh, talk a little bit about what the bail schedule is and maybe what I've heard people say about the court's bail schedule and what it means. And I do think there is a, a little bit of misunderstanding about what the bail schedule is. So let me just give a kind of a quick overview. What the bail schedule is, is the court's sort of set presumptive bail bails that happen when somebody gets arrested. Um, a couple of things about the current bail schedule. First of all, there have always, always been court bail schedules. Um, what they allow is for an arresting officer to uh, bring somebody to a correctional facility and look at the schedule, which is literally a list of things that can happen, and follow it release somebody on their own recognizance or charge the bail amounts that are listed in that schedule. And this is has always, and, and indeed since I, I found some from the 70s, I don't know how far back they go, but that's as far as I could find, have been in effect. Um, there are a couple of things that by rule cannot be on a bail schedule. This does not apply to felonies. Anybody arrested for a felony is not covered by a bail schedule. It just can't happen. So if somebody has a vehicle theft and charged with a C felony and is brought to jail, if you hear somebody say because of the bail schedule that person was released, it, it cannot happen. That is not the case. It doesn't apply to felonies. It doesn't apply to any crimes of domestic violence or violating a condition of release that was set in a crime of domestic violence. Those people by statute have to be held until they see a judge the next day at arraignments. Uh, it does have a list of things that are presumptively uh, uh, OR releases, meaning the person should be released on their own recognizance. The bail schedule also includes, in several places, provisions that say if an arresting officer or correctional officer believes that the amounts set in the bail schedule, whether it's in a dollar amount or whether it's the OR release, are inappropriate in any particular situation, that officer, law enforcement or correctional officer, can call an on-call judge. The court system has on-call judges on duty 24-7 for that very purpose. They well, also do other second. things. I would just want to note that Representative Eastman and Representative Ledoux have joined us. Continue, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, so to continue about the bail schedule. So those are a couple of things that I think may be a bit of misperceptions. No felonies, no DV. You can always call for a different bail in a particular situation. Um, so what happened with the current bail schedule is right around when SB 91 was being debated in uh, fall, uh, spring of 2016, more information had come forward. Social science and, and research that had come out of the Criminal Justice Commission uh, showing that there were uh, issues, what people perceived to be problems, with the pretrial release of certain defendants. And what some of the research and data had shown is that our Alaska's pretrial population had grown 81% over the last 10 years. So that was a piece of data that was pulled from Alaska's own files by, by others related to the Criminal Justice Commission research and analysis that they were doing. In response to this, the legislature in SB 91 uh, 
enacted the piece that isn't in effect yet, but that will go into effect in January, and that is all the uh, reforms to the pretrial decision making, including, as you've heard about, the new pretrial services division within the Department of Corrections, and a very uh, completely revised uh, bail statute. That is the statute that the judges use to look at and determine whether somebody should be released how, in what conditions, and what kind of bonds and bail should be set. Those changes go into effect in January. Um, they were made, the legislative clear intent on the record is because it was deemed that there were too many people in jail pretrial. Um, I've heard different numbers, but I can't remember if it's 27% or 40% of our prison population is made up of pretrial individuals. That is individuals who have not yet been found guilty or pled guilty. They're arrested awaiting a determination of their case. This was considered by the Criminal Justice Commission and by this legislature to be uh, perhaps not the best use of our prison beds and perhaps not the best way to handle pretrial defendants. So the uh, presiding judges at that point in time, one of whom happens to sit on the Criminal Justice Commission, uh, re-examined the bail schedules. And what had happened prior to March of 2016 is each individual presiding judge had their own bail schedule for their district, reflecting community norms and other uh, differences around the state. And in fact, there were many bail schedules, one for Palmer, one Kodiak, uh, one second district, one first district, one Anchorage. Um, and they had slightly varying provisions in them. So the presiding judges determined it might be wiser to have a statewide uh, uniform bail schedule. And so they got together over many meetings and put together a bail schedule that would uh, recognize this latest research about pretrial defendants and also more closely adhere to the existing bail statute. The existing bail statute, which doesn't get changed until January, has a clear presumption for releasing somebody on their own recognizance unless, only two unlesses, uh, something more is needed to prevent the person from uh, not appearing in court or to protect the victim, the community, and others from that person. So unless a judge really can find that something more is needed to prevent a failure to appear or because the person is a threat, the presumption in the existing statute is to release the person on their own recognizance. In any case, in recognition of the research and of the, the clear statutes, the judges uh, revised the bail schedule and issued a statewide one. They did provide that more misdemeanors, remember only misdemeanors, would qualify for an OR release, that is the person would be released. And again, this had been happening you know, all along for different types of misdemeanors, but there had been variations. And they set dollar amounts of established bail for certain things. Uh, so, for example, a first DUI, driving under the influence now under the statewide bail schedule, is an OR release. Some people have uh, been, you know, think that that might not be appropriate. So a couple things go into that, though. In SB 91, this legislature said that for a first DUI, a person cannot spend any of the three-day mandatory prison time in jail. That, that time will be spent on electronic monitoring or on basically house arrest. So if you're a presiding judge and, and somebody is arrested for their first DUI and the legislative intent is that person shouldn't spend any time in a jail bed, it, you're, you're hard pressed to say that you're gonna hold that person for 24 hours in a jail bed until they see uh, a judicial officer. So a couple of times subsequent to March, the presiding judges revised their bail schedule. Most of the uh, problems were with the violating conditions of release provision. As you know, SB 91 made that misdemeanor into a violation, but made it an arrestable violation. And there was confusion about what you do when somebody is arrested for that, taken to a correctional facility, and yet the law says they can't spend any time in jail because violations don't include jail time. So there was a little bit of back and forth. Um, the presiding judges tried to revise that a few times. One of the revisions they made, by the way, was in response to feedback from law enforcement who were dissatisfied with the fact that a uh, misdemeanor assault was 
was an OR release under the initial drafts of the bail schedule. Uh, in response, the judges got together and revised the bail schedule. Currently, a misdemeanor assault is not an OR release. And again, that was really in response to that feedback from law enforcement that they felt that that was inappropriate. Um, so, so now, if somebody gets arrested for that, there's a dollar amount that they have to post. Uh, and uh, so, that, so that, again, was just sort of a, a responsive change that they made. The presiding judges would um, look at any recommendations that come into them. Uh, the one recommendation that I've heard, or I've heard sort of dissatisfaction among some people, is an issue with the fact that law enforcement uh, isn't clear or would like to re retain in custody those who have, those who are um, drunk or um, maybe have a drug problem at that moment. So when law enforcement arrests somebody, say, for, an, for a um, low-level misdemeanor, trespassing, something like that, and brings them in, if the person is intoxicated, um, there is some dissatisfaction that the bail schedule doesn't say that that person should be held. So there are a couple of responses to that. Um, first, as I've mentioned, in any particular case, if law enforcement isn't happy with the release called for under the bail schedule, they can call a judge. And when they call a judge at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, you know, I know it says OR, but this person is either a threat or uh, has a problem or something, the judge would, in all likelihood, hold the person or impose a bail amount. Um, so that is always an option. And uh, whether law enforcement does that or not is you know, up to them, but they can. And they, they really should. And the bail schedule you know, calls on them to do that. Um, secondly, the presiding judges really did not agree that there is a basis for holding somebody in jail until they're sober. Um, there was a, a great discussion about that, um, but they couldn't reach agreement that it, it was um, in keeping with the law to hold somebody in jail until they're sober. They didn't see a legal basis for doing that because it's not against the law to be drunk. And um, so uh, it, they did, don't have that in the bail schedule. And I know that that is a point of contention for some people. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Representative Millette. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mead, for being here. I appreciate all the work that you've done and uh, all the support you've given our office over the years working on criminal justice reform um, <clears throat> to the sober law, as we're calling it. Um, so <clears throat> did some research last night, and there's been some pretty significant cases where I've, I understand the, the, the want of the public safety people to be able to hold someone. Um, we had the death in Fairbanks. Um, of the woman who got released on her own recognizance, was intoxicated, and went out and died. Um, I pulled up, just did a quick search on the internet. Uh, a guy was charged with two DWIs on the same day in Eagle River. While you say it's something that they can do and they can um, call a judge to do, uh, my question is, this was standard operating procedure up until, I think, a year and a half ago. And can you tell me what what stopped public safety from making that? Was it something that the courts did? Was it something that the judges said? Because at this point, I'd like to codify it. I'd like them, I'd like folks, I'd like that tool to be in their toolbox, especially when it comes to rural Alaska and some of the issues that we're having out there with alcohol abuse. So um, Representative Millett, yesterday I'd said we were going to keep questions to a minute. You're at a minute, and I think you asked a question, so I'll let Ms. Mead answer your question. Through the Chair, Representative Millett, if I understand you're saying uh, why uh, did the judges remove from a bail schedule the uh, idea that law, uh, the correctional facility can hold somebody until they're at a certain sobriety level. And uh, a couple of things about that. That was not the case statewide. In the first judicial district, they never had a provision saying that you hold somebody until a certain drug alcohol amount. Uh, it had been in Anchorage, and that is what some people were used to, namely the uh, APD and troopers who work in Anchorage. So there had been a provision that somebody could be held. I think what, well, what happened is the four presiding judges, when they got together, did not agree whether that was appropriate or not. Um, at a time when the legislature was saying, let's 
be careful about who we're keeping in hard beds. Um, for the presiding judges to have a provision basically making DOC the detox center, because there wasn't a different place to put the people, did not seem justified by the law. And uh, at least to some of the presiding judges, there was disagreement. And so if, I, I mean, the legislature could say in a law that uh, if the court has a bail schedule, it it must provide that people shall be held until their BAC is at a certain level. You can do that. The presiding judges didn't, as a group, <laughs> um, reach agreement that that was a valid thing to do under the existing law. Follow up. Representative Millett. So um, my concern is public safety. I mean, is it safe to release someone that's uh, over the legal limit of alcohol to go out and possibly harm someone else? And that, that's where I struggle, because I think it is a good policy. Um, so would you oppose an amendment to 54 that added that provision back in in statute? Through the chair, Representative Millett, that provision was never in statute. If you wanted to add something like that to SB 54, the court system w would be neutral about it. And with respect to public safety, again, if there is any perceived safety threat in any particular situation, they can call the judge, and the judge would impose a bail that would retain the person. Um, a lot of first-time DUIs, for example, um, that person, you know, kind of statistically does appear and is not a threat to the community. Your car isn't available to you. You can call your spouse to come and pick you up. So as a presumption, as a line saying that anyone with an alcohol amount above a certain level shouldn't be released, I mean, that is your policy call, but there's two, two ways to look at that. One more question. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't affect the third party. I mean, this is just someone who doesn't, is getting released on their own recognizant without a third party person. So w that's still available to someone who needs to be released and ha have a third party come pick them up, from what I understand. That's always available. This wouldn't change that. We just say someone who doesn't have a third party picking them up. Through the chair, Representative Millett, I'm not positive I understand, but I, I think it would depend on how the statute is worded. If you said that a person can be uh, or must be uh, detained in custody until their BAC is at 0.08 or below, then they th then they would stay in jail. Whether you know my husband could come pick me up after I got my DUI or not, but you could put or is released to a responsible sober adult, and that would cover the situation where okay my BAC is too high, but uh, if somebody responsible can pick me up, then it can be a release. Uh, it would depend on how the the potential <laughs> statute is worded. I think. Thank you. And Representative Millett, part of the confusion with your question is that there's both third party custodians, which are court approved to provide supervision, as distinct from a third party who, as Ms. Mead has described, a spouse or a friend who happens to be sober that's happy to take them home that wouldn't be subject to review by the court as to whether that person meets some criteria for a court approved third party. That's, I think that was the reason that question created some confusion. Representative Ledoux. You just clarified what I was going to clarify. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Ms. Mead? Representative Christ Tompkins. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mead, I, I was wondering if you could perhaps comment further on the degree to which the on-call judges are um, engaged with by law enforcement presently. Is this a once in a blue moon kind of thing? I mean, I, I'm maybe kind of reading between the leaves with, with your testimony, but could you speak a little bit more to the degree to which the law enforcement community is aware that this is an option and that it is um, taken advantage of? Through the chair, Representative Christ Tompkins, I don't have the data on the number of times that law enforcement is called. I can tell you that I have heard uh, anecdotally from the judges um, different things. In the first judicial district, I understand they call me all the time. I'm on call and I get many calls and when I get the call, it's uh, just a law enforcement officer online and if that person and his or her professional judgment uh, d says that this person is either a threat or you know there's a medical issue or or whatever it might be, you know by and large we go ahead and agree with that person and, and establish a bail amount. So that is routine in the first judicial district. In Anchorage, the magistrates are not just on call 24-7, but present in the courthouse 24-7. And so in Anchorage in particular, it happens routinely um, because the law enforcement officer doesn't just call but can bring a person in front of the magistrate. And if the magistrate uh, views somebody who is uh, 
visibly in a condition such that they shouldn't be released, um, bail can be set routinely. In other judicial districts, I'm not certain. I know in Fairbanks it's fairly routine. Um, in Bethel, I'm not certain, but people are on call and they get calls. They don't love to be on call because they get calls about this. <laughs> so it happens. Thank you. Um, I had one question if you can comment on it. There's, I think yesterday there was some discussion about Title 47 holds versus Title 12 and Title 11 holds and Title 47 being the Health and Human Services title and 11 is the Criminal Code and Title 12 is the C Code of Criminal Procedure. But um, can you comment about those particular issues as it relates to the question of holding somebody who may be intoxicated but hasn't hasn't necessarily committed, well, may have committed a crime, but we're not asking the question very well. But if you could provide a little bit more insight about those issues to the extent you can. To the chair, uh, Representative Clayman, um, a, a Title 47 hold is has a much higher standard for retaining somebody or having somebody sent to a, a mental health facility. Um, if somebody is so intoxicated, and I don't know the standard off the top of my head, but they, they have to be severely intoxicated and a danger to themselves. And then a judge can have a very specialized hearing to w see whether that person should be committed against their will to, say, Charter North Hospital to be ex hospitalized for three days to be examined. Those are are not extremely common. The person has to be really um, in, in, a, in a very bad state to have a Title 47. It's, it's like a mental commitment, and it's a very um, severe restriction on the person's rights, and there are very high hurdles in order to commit somebody under Title 47. You have to have doctors involved. So those are not terribly common. Now, short of that, people can be quite intoxicated um, and having been arrested and be very intoxicated but not quite reach the level where uh, psychologists get involved and substance abuse providers get involved to determine that this person needs to be hospitalized to, uh, to save themselves from themselves or, to, or because they're such a, a threat. Um, so short of the Title 47 commitments is where you would find under the bail schedule the statement that if a person is uh, uh, considered to be a present danger to the public through a level of intoxication, not that would reach Title 47, the arresting officer shall contact a, ju a judicial officer for a different bail. So those are two, two quite different proceedings. The Title 47, um, rightly so by statute, is quite a high hurdle to, um, to detain somebody. And there has to be, there doesn't need to be a crime related to a Title 47 commitment. Somebody can call up and say either my you know, my, my sibling is in a mental state and needs to be, you know, is threatening suicide or threatening some other um, action with weapons or something like that that's very severe or is so intoxicated that, that this person needs to be hospitalized against their will. Um, and then, as I say, doctors get involved in everything. Representative Fansler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through, through the chair, uh, it, it sounds like to me maybe one of the questions to ask, in your opinion, would you say there's been proper training and proper discussion of how to handle these cases since it seems like we have some disparity throughout the different judicial districts as to how they handle a situation where someone may be arrested and intoxicated. Uh, is there a way that we could have better training for our public safety and for our court system to uh, have better results? Through the Chair, Representative Fansler, uh, probably yes. The, probably there is a way to have better training. Um, when the presiding judges revised the bail, bail schedule, we distribute it, and we distribute it to every clerk of court and say, send it to all your law enforcement agencies in your area. So that, and that happens, and, and, and I'm certain that happens. When it arrives at the law enforcement agency, and as you know, there are, there are many, um, what they do with it, I don't know. And uh, what, what we did with the latest bail schedule is include a, a one-pager um, chart, kind of like easy reference, because it's long. And it includes all these paragraphs and explanations and a paragraph about DV with a cite to the statute. So there's a one-pager that 
I have many copies of someplace, that hopefully they would tape up next to their phone. And I think in many cases that's exactly what they do with it. I know that's what APD does with it. And they can look, oh, it's this, it's going to be a $500 bail. Or, oh, it's this, it's going to be an OR release. So we tried to make it simple for them. Um, I also am always available to answer questions. And I get questions. And I get questions from a law enforcement officer in Sitka calling and saying, hey, do I do this under the bail schedule? I'm happy to help with that. Um, whether there should be something more formalized, um, always more training is better. Uh, through the Criminal Justice Commission, I know that the, the troopers and uh, on that commission also sits a representative from Anchorage Police Department now, I think, uh, are aware that, that they should call if they have a question. Now, whether everyone knows that, I don't know. Whether they read the bail schedule that gets sent to them, I don't know. Um, but. I mean, we, we publicize it as much as we can, and I would do more, and I'm happy to come to your communities and help explain it. I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Um, we have some amendments. We're going to take a short recess so I can see the status of that, and we'll be back, I would say, less than five minutes. And but we need to copy them and get them ready, and then after, then we're also going to go through and get the remaining 17 in order. So we're, what we'll do is we're going to recess to the call of the chair, and probably within 10 to 15 minutes we'll have um, the first five amendments here at the distributed, so you all can look at those and review. My thought is that you should have a chance to look at the amendments before we actually start discussing them. So we'll have.